morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just to correct one point of fact, I, I happen to be the chairman of the Great uh, Britain uh, Russia Society. Masha Karp is the uh, chairman of uh, the Pushkin Club, but I'm a long standing member. I'm sorry about that. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, may I just introduce our two uh, guest readers? Uh, first of all, Lucy Daniels, a former chair of Pushkin Club, uh, who will be reading uh, the translations of Lermontov's poems along with me. And uh, secondly, um, Ala Gelich, who will be reciting uh, the poems in Russian. And I believe uh, Dennis has kindly made the text of the poems and um, translations available. So you will be able to follow our reading uh, by reference to the text. Now, this evening, uh, we are celebrating the life and work of Mikhail Yuryevich Lermontov, Russia's greatest poet after Pushkin and also a great prose writer. This year is the, annivers is the 180th anniversary of his death. Uh, Mikhail uh, Yuryevich Lermontov was born in Moscow on the night of the 2nd to 3rd October 1814. It's thought that his distant forebears uh, were Scottish. One of them, George Learmont, uh, moved to Russia in the 17th century. Uh, Lermontov's maternal grandmother, Elizaveta Alexeyevna Arseneva uh, was a member of the influential Stalifin family. Oh. His mother uh, died of consumption uh, when he was three years old, uh, so he barely knew her. Uh, when his father died some years later, in October 1831, uh, this event caused the teenage Lermontov to meditate on the premature deaths of both his mother and his father and inspired him at the age of 17 uh, to write his famous poem, The Angel. That's Lermontov's father and his mother. In this beautiful poem, uh, Lermontov recalls songs his mother used uh, to sing to him. We'll now read uh, this poem. The Angel. An angel was flying through the midnight sky and softly he sang as he flew. And the moon and the stars and the clouds were entranced by his heavenly song. He sang of the blessed who live without sin in the shade of the gardens of heaven. He sang of God's greatness and pure and unfeigned was his praise. He bore in his arms a young soul for this world of sorrow and tears. And the melody of his song stayed with the young soul, wordless but alive. For a long time, the soul languished on earth filled with a strange wondrous desire and the tedious songs of earth could never quench its longing for the celestial sounds of heaven. Ангел По небу полуночи ангел летел и тихую песню он пел и месяц и звезды и тучи толпой Внимали той песни святой. Он пел о блаженстве безгрешных духов Под кущами райских садов. О Боге великом он пел, И хвала его непритворна была. Он душу молодую в объятиях нес Для мира печали и слез. 
и звук его песни в душе молодой остался без слов, но живой. И долго на свете томилась она желанием чудным полна. И звуков небес заменить не могли ей скучные песни земли. After his mother's death, uh, Lermontov, from the age of three, was brought up by his grandmother on her estate at Tarkani in Penza province. Mikhail lived with her for the next 10 years. He liked to play with the Sarf children on the estate. These encounters gave him a great command of Russian vernacular speech and a knowledge of folk songs. In his childhood, he also spent several summers in the Caucasus, which left a deep and lasting impression on him and was to be the subject of many of his works. Lermontov received a thorough early education at home, studying uh, several foreign languages, including English, French, and German. He also studied uh, drawing and became an accomplished painter, as you will see from some of this evening's slides. He was also an excellent musician. In the spring of 1827, uh, when he was uh, 12 years old, Elizaveta Alexeyevna decided that it was time uh, for him to go to school in Moscow, where he attended the nobleman's pension. Mikhail uh, lived in Moscow for the next five years and would always consider Moscow his home. He wrote in a letter, Moscow is my home and always will be. Here I was born. Here I knew much suffering and here too I was happy. He also wrote later, Moskva, Moskva, Lublu tibia kak syn, kak ruski, silna, plamina, iniezna. Moscow, Moscow, I love you like a son, like a Russian, strongly, ardently, and tenderly. It was in Moscow that he began to write poetry. Pushkin, Schiller, and Byron were all strong influences on him. Lermontov's first real romantic love, when he was 15 or 16 years old, uh, was Yekaterina uh, Sushkova. He met her in 1830 at dancing classes in Moscow. She was two years older than he was. Mikhail developed a passionate infatuation for her but Katerina didn't take him at all seriously and treated him with amused and cool disdain. A significant episode occurred in August, 1830. Elizaveta Alexeyevna decided that she and Mikhail should make a pilgrimage to the Monastery of the Holy Trinity, about 70 miles from Moscow. Yekaterina and her friend, Alexandra Vereshagina, uh, went with them. When they arrived, they went into the Trinity Cathedral to pray. At the vaulted porch, a blind beggar stretched out his begging bowl to them. Okay, mm -hmm. When he heard coins drop into his bowl, he thanked them with tears in his eyes and contrasted their kindness with the callous behavior of some practical jokers who the previous day had dropped stones into his bowl. Lermontov seemed unusually moved by the beggar's words. When they returned to the hospice, Mikhail suddenly started writing very fast. When he had finished, he handed to Katerina the poem he had just written out. The title of this poem is Nishi, the beggar, and we're now going to read it. The beggar. At the gates of the holy monastery stood a poor, shriveled man begging for alms. 
was all he saw. His suffering was clear to see, and in his outstretched hand, someone placed a stone. So I begged you to love me with bitter tears and grief. And so through your indifference, you destroyed my deepest feelings forever. Nishi. <coughs> У врат обители святой Стоял просящий подаяние бедняк, Иссохший, чуть живой, От глада, жажды и страдания. Куска лишь хлеба он просил И взор являл живую муку, И кто-то камень положил. В его протянутую руку. Так я молил твоей любви, Слезами горькими, с тоскою. Так чувства лучшие мои Обмануты навек тобою. The poem was coldly received by Yekaterina, who continued to make fun of Mikhail. This was an entirely new situation for him. Previously, he had had everything he wanted, but now he had been emphatically rejected by the first woman he had fallen in love with. In September 1830, uh, Lyamantov, who was still only 15, enrolled at Moscow University and opted for the Department of Literature. It was in May of the next year, in 1831, that Lyamantov met Natalia Ivanova. Uh, she was the orphaned daughter of the well-known Moscow playwright, Fyodor Ivanov. Lyamantov quickly fell passionately in love with Natalia. He composed over 30 poems to her. Only later did he appreciate that she had not the faintest idea of their meaning. This uh, romance lasted a mere month. It came to a dramatic end at the beginning of June, 1831. Lermontov was staying with the Ivanovs uh, for a few days. He bounded into the drawing room to read Natalia some of his new poems, only to be told that she had just become engaged to be married. Mikhail left the room overwhelmed with grief. A powerful change came over him after this unhappy affair. A thirst for revenge took hold of him, like some demonic possession, and was to remain with him for the rest of his life. In 1831, uh, Lermontov got to know the Lapuchin family. They were a prominent family in Moscow. In November of that year, he started to pay attention to the Lapuchin's youngest daughter, Vavara Lapuchina. Unlike his other loves, Vavara was younger. She was 16, Mikhail was now 17. He called her Varinka. She had striking features and large dark eyes, as you can see in this portrait by Lyavantov. In this further portrait, Bavara is shown dressed as a nun and Lyavantov is here portraying her as the heroine of his greatest narrative poem, uh, The Demon. Vavara Lapukina was to be the great love of Lermontov's life. His relationship with her, although it was to prove ill-fated, was probably the, the deepest and most serious of his life. Vavara Lapukina 
uh, was to feature as Viera in Princess Mary, which is the main story of a hero of our time. It was in the spring of 1832 that Mikhail and Vavara fell in love with each other. Lyamantov felt that he had at last found someone who understood him and shared his feelings. He was so happy that he forgot all about his university course. He skipped lectures and when exam time came round, he simply failed to turn up. Now, Mikhail had already damaged his reputation by his rebellious behavior and his impertinence to the professors. His failure to sit the second year exams was the final straw and he was duly expelled. He had already set his mind on a literary career and his grandmother agreed that he should now try his luck at St. Petersburg University. Elisaveta Alexeyevna and Mikhail arrived in the capital in August 1832. Lyamantov did not at first take to the new city. He found its straight lines too severe by contrast with Moscow's twisting streets and more exotic architecture. Moreover, it was damp and misty. However, he was inspired by a sail down the river Neva to write uh, Parus, the sail. This well-known and beautiful poem is a poignant expression of Lermontov's state of mind as he starts a new life in St. Petersburg. Uh, we'll now read this poem. The sail. A solitary white sail moves through the blue mist of the sea. What is it seeking in far off lands? What has it left behind? The waves play and the wind whistles while the masthead groans and creaks. Happiness, alas, it does not seek, nor does it wish to flee. Brighter than azure is the sea below. The sunlight glows golden above. But restless of soul, it craves storms. As if in storms, it could find peace. Parus. Belieb parus adinokai. В тумане моря голубом, Что ищет он в стране далекой, Что кинул он в краю родном? Играют волны, ветер свищет, И мачта гнется и скрипит. Увы, он счастье не ищет И не от счастья бежит. Под ним Струя светлей лазури, над ним луч солнца золотой, а он мятежный просит бури, как будто в бурях есть покой. Life in St. Petersburg, in fact, began with a disappointment for Mikhail. The rector of St. Petersburg University refused to recognize the two years he had spent at Moscow University. This was too much for Lyamantov. He was horrified at the prospect of another three years as a student, and so he abandoned all thoughts of further study. Two of his relatives had both opted for military careers. Even though by character, <coughs> temperament, and education, he was singularly ill-fitted for military discipline, Mikhail decided in November 1832 to enroll as a cadet in the Junkers Military School. This was a school for the training of officers for the prestigious Lifeguards Regiment. But it was just Lermontov's bad luck that his decision to enter the Junkers Military School coincided with the tightening of military discipline there. He had very much been looking forward to the literature classes, but these were now abolished. The lessons instead 
were on purely military matters and drill. Mikhail looked back on Moscow University, which at the time he had not really fully appreciated with deep nostalgia. The Junkers prayer just about sums up Lyamantov's attitude to his military school. We'll now read uh, this poem. The Junkers prayer. Heavenly Father, please save me from tightly cut coats as from the fires of hell. All marchers, let me evade and don't make me go on parade. When we're out riding, let Alexei's voice, if possible, trouble us as little as possible. One more request I ask you to grant. Permission next Sunday to report late for duty. O oh Lord Most High, credit me at least with this that with unnecessary requests, I will not bother you. Юнкерская молитва. Царю небесный, спаси меня от куртки тесной, как от огня. От маршировки меня избавь, в пародировки меня не ставь. Пускай в манеже Алёхин глаз как можно реже тревожит нас. Еще моленье прошу принять. В то воскресенье дай разрешение мне опоздать. Я, царь Всевышний, хорош уж тем, что просьбой лишней не надоем. <laughs> Lermontov called the period he spent at the military school from 1832 to 1834 the two terrible years. He found some solace by taking part in the wild carousing of his fellow cadets and he stroke up uh, and he struck up a close friendship uh, with his relative Alexei Stalipin who now became his constant companion. Lyamantov called him Mongo. In 1834, Lyamantov passed out as a cornet in the Hussar Regiment of the Lifeguards. His grandmother was delighted and extremely proud of him. He was posted to Tsarskoye Selo, the Tsar's residence just outside St. Petersburg. It was also about this time that Mikhail heard that Alexei Lapukhin, Vavara's brother, was becoming romantically involved with Yekaterina Sushkova, who had by then also moved to St. Petersburg. And he began to be tormented with jealous thoughts about this. A rather bizarre but unfortunate sequence of events mm -hmm. then unfolded, which Lermontov later described in his unfinished novel uh, Princess Ligovskaya. Mikhail Yurevich does not come out of this very well. He himself described how he cynically courted Yekaterina Sushkova. He pretended so well that he was passionately in love with her that in December 1834 she herself fell in love with him. But almost as soon as Yekaterina had declared her love for him, Lermontov started publicly to cool off and became cold and indifferent towards her in society. He then resorted to what he described as a charming ruse. On the 5th of January 1835, he wrote an anonymous letter addressed to the Sushkov family in which the anonymous author in effect warned Yekaterina of Lermontov's dishonorable intentions. The letter was signed, your unknown and devoted friend. The letter had the desired effect. 
and Lermontov was banned from the Sushkov's house, which was exactly what he had intended. Many years later, Yekaterina described in her memoirs what a terrible ordeal this whole affair had been for her. At a ball later that year, Mikhail coldly ignored Yekaterina. She was desperate for an explanation. When he finally spoke to her, Mikhail brutally revealed that he himself was the author of the anonymous letter and bluntly told Yekaterina as follows. To put it in a nutshell, I do not love you anymore. Maybe I never even loved you in the first place. So he had achieved his revenge for the humiliation he had suffered when Yekaterina had rejected his love five years previously. However, Nemesis was already in train. It was in fact on the very same day when Lyamantov had set the anonymous letter that he himself received a most unwelcome piece of news. The news was that Varvara Lapukina, who had heard rumors about his courting of Yekaterina Sushkova, was going to marry Nikolai Bakhmetyev, a very rich but portly and uninspiring man who was 16 years older than she was. This was a shattering blow for Mikhail. However, he displayed no apparent remorse or concern for Yekaterina. For a time, Lermontov lost himself in elaborate parties and epic drinking bouts. He ridiculed the idea of happiness in his play Masquerade. Masquerade. Uh, this was his chief dramatic work. Altogether, Lermontov wrote five plays. Masquerade is the only play he attempted to have published and performed. The play is based on the Othello plot, uh, transferred to the world of high society balls and gaming houses of 19th century St. Petersburg. Masquerade enjoys repertory status in Russian theater and has attracted such directors as Sievolod Mayerhold. It has also been made into a film, a production by the Vachtangov Theater with a stunning musical uh, score by Khatya Churian, was canceled just after um, several performances in 1941 because of the outbreak of war. And Masquerade uh, was performed in Britain in the late 1990s. A crucial event occurred at the end of January 1837, which was to have a great effect on the rest of Lermontov's life. This was the death mm. of Alexander Pushkin on the 29th of January, 1837, following his duel with Lieutenant Dantes. The news that Pushkin had died had a huge effect on Lermontov. He realized how much the older poet meant to him. He felt that a great light had gone out from the world. During this time, Lyamantov was highly agitated and very unwell and was as a result confined to his room. In a highly emotional and indignant state, he composed his great poem, Smiet Poeta the death of a poet. He wrote this elegy in a day. The poet expressed both anger and sorrow that the, that the prophet's lips were sealed. The poem circulated throughout St. Petersburg like wildfire. Soon there was hardly anyone in the capital who had not read the poem. Lyamantov, who was now 22 years old, became famous overnight. He continued though to brood on Pushkin's death. He was still unable to leave his room. Then he heard rumors that the St. Petersburg aristocracy 
were not in fact mourning Pushkin's death at all, but were continuing to spread slanderous lies about him. Another paroxysm of rage took hold of Lermontov. He felt so strongly about Pushkin's death that he wrote another 16 lines to be added to the original poem. We will now read these additional lines from the death of a poet. From the death of a poet. And you, arrogant, haughty sons of famous fathers, renowned for their base infamy, whose servile feet have trampled on the remnants of nobler but less favoured families, you, greedily crowd around the throne, you butchers of freedom, genius and glory. You hide behind the law. You expect all truth and justice to bow before you. But God's judgment awaits you, sponsors of depravity, and you will not escape his sentence. He cannot be bought for gold. He knows in advance your every thought and deed. It won't help you then to resort to slander. It won't help you any more. And all your black blood will not wash away the righteous blood of the poet. А вы, надменные потомки, известной подлостью прославленных отцов, пятою рабскую поправшие обломки, игрою счастья обиженных родов. Вы, жадную толпой, стоящую у трона, свободы, гения и славы палачи. Таитесь вы под сенью закона, пред вами суд и правда, все молчи. Но есть и Божий суд на перстнике разврата. Есть грозный судья, он ждет, он недоступен звону злата, и мысли, и дела он знает наперед. Тогда напрасно вы прибегнете к злословью, оно вам не поможет вновь, и вы не смоете. Всей вашей черной кровью поэта праведную кровь. <coughs> Copies of these additional 16 lines flew around St. Petersburg mm. as quickly as the original poem had. The authorities were not amused <coughs> by what was virtually a direct attack on the aristocracy. Tsar Nicholas I was sent a copy of the second version of the poem by post. This copy bore the anonymous inscription, A Summons to Revolution. Tsar Nicholas reacted strongly and ordered a rigorous investigation into the case of the impermissible verses. Lyamantov's flat in Sasko Silo was searched, his devoted friend Svetislav Rayevsky was accused of distributing copies of the poem, placed under arrest and interrogated. Lyamantov was also interrogated. Both were found guilty. Lyamantov of writing and Rayevsky of circulating subversive literature. By an imperial order, Cornet Lyamantov was expelled from the lifeguard hussars. He was exiled to the Caucasus to serve, albeit in the same rank, in the Nizhe Gorodsky Dragoons. His fellow officers were not even allowed to throw a farewell dinner party for him. An even grimmer fate awaited Dryevsky for having circulated copies of the poem. He was imprisoned in the Peter and Paul fortress for a month and then banished to the far north. Lyamantov left St. Petersburg in late March, 1837, and broke his journey to the Caucasus in Moscow. 
Although at this stage, Mikhail was emotionally focused on his lost love, Varvara, his thoughts also turned to Yekaterina Soshkova. He still thought of her with tenderness. He thought of one of the lyrics that he had written to Yekaterina in the heyday of his first love and decided to rewrite it. This is the poem, Rastalis Mui, not Tvoi Potriat. We parted, but your portrait I still hold. We'll now read this poem. We parted, but your portrait I still hold close to my heart. Like a pale reflection of better times, it brings joy to my soul. And even though I gave myself to new passions, I am still unable to part with it. A temple abandoned is still a temple. An idol overthrown is still a god. <clears throat> Расстались мы, но твой портрет я на груди моей храню. Как бледный призрак лучших лет, он душу радует мою. И новым преданный страстям я разлюбить его не мог. Так храм оставленный, все храм. Кумир поверженный, все Бог. It was also during his short stay in Moscow in March 1837 that he wrote the famous patriotic epic Borodino. As we know, this poem inspired Tolstoy to write War and Peace. Uh -huh. During his stay in Moscow, Lermontov made a point of visiting his old fellow student in the Junker school and friend, Nikolai Martinov, uh, before Martinov left to join his regiment in the Caucasus. When the time subsequently came for Lermontov uh, to bid his own farewells, Martinov's father asked him to deliver a bulky envelope containing 300 rubles and letters from the family to Martinov. Mikhail Yurevich readily agreed. <clears throat> it was on the 10th of April, 1837, that Lermontov finally set off to join his regiment in the Caucasus. <clears throat> Russian involvement in the Caucasus at this time was just as bloody an affair as it has been in recent years. Although in his first exile, Lermontov hardly saw any active service, his exile was an eventful one, and not without adventure. He set off for Stavropol, where his new regiment was stationed. However, he very quickly succumbed to an acute attack of rheumatism, and was given permission to travel to Piatigorsk, a spa town, to take a cure. He was so ill that he had to be carried out on a stretcher. Lermontov spent May and June in 1837 convalescing in Piatigorsk. He had earlier tried to write a novel based on his experiences, Princess Ligovskaya, Knaginia Ligovskaya, which he had never finished. He now resolved to rewrite his novel, uh, but in a different setting. That's how he conceived Princess Mary, Knyazhna Mary, the main story in his principal prose work, A Hero of Our Time, Geroi Nashiva Vremeni. Yekaterina Sushkova would appear as Princess Mary, Bavara would feature as Viera. A Hero of Our Time is an outstanding work of creative genius, and in it, Lermontov's brilliance as a prose writer is displayed to the full. The work consists of five short stories or novellas, which are interlinked by Pechorin, the common, and pr the common protagonist. 
But Chorin is a complex and fascinating character. Like Yevgeny Anyegin, he is a superfluous man, Lishny Chelyviek, not in tune with his age or the society in which he lived. Pechorin also reminds one of a Byronic hero. He is proud, energetic, strong-willed, and at odds with the world, and at the same time, embittered, cynical, mm. and bored with life. A hero of our time was a major breakthrough in Russian literature. Lyamantov's masterpiece may be regarded as the first example of psychological realism in the Russian novel, which later on was developed further by Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. By the summer of 1837, Lermontov was cured of rheumatism and ready to rejoin his regiment. It was in early September 1837, on his way to join his regiment, that he had his first taste of adventure. He arrived at a wretched <coughs> little town called Tamania on the Black Sea yes. coast, oh, yes. where he was quartered yeah. in, in, a miserable, in a miserable thatched hut. The encounter he had there with smugglers, a beautiful girl and a blind boy, he described in his short oh. story called Tamania. This work was highly praised by Chekhov, who referred to it as the perfect short story. When discussing Lermontov's prose, Chekhov also commented as follows. I don't know a better language than his. I would have taken his story and analyzed it as they do at school, sentence by sentence. This is the way to learn how to write. Many other writers have also praised Lermontov's gifts as a prose writer. Uh, Nikolai Gogol, for example, wrote as follows. No one has yet written such sound, beautiful and fragrant prose. Coming back to Tamani, the story recounts how Pechorin, like Lermontov himself, was nearly drowned in the course of a nocturnal adventure and how when he returned to his hovel, he discovered that all his money, his sword, and his Dagestan dagger had been stolen. However, there was one detail that was not mentioned in the short story. That is that in addition to Lermontov's own money, his sword and dagger, the letter to Martinov containing 300 rubles, which had been entrusted to him, had also been stolen. As we shall see later, this theft was to have serious consequences for the poet. Eventually, uh, Lermontov joined his regiment, <clears throat> which was soon transferred to Tiflis, now, now Tbilisi, in Georgia. It was while he was in Tiflis that Lermontov heard the good news that the Tsar had signed an order for his pardon and his transfer to the Grodno Guards Regiment at Novgorod. He also managed finally to meet up with Martinov. His first concern was to pay Martinov the missing 300 rubles out of his own pocket. Mikhail Yurevich explained how the letter and money had been stolen from him and apologized. One might have expected Martinov to be grateful for this, but instead he reacted very angrily and uh, jumped to the conclusion that Lermontov must have opened the letter and read the contents, as otherwise he would not have known there was money in it. Lermontov shrugged his shoulders and laughed. But after this incident, Martinov became hostile to his former friend. In late November 1837, Lermontov left for his new regiment at Novgorod. When he finally got back uh, to St. Petersburg, as a result of his grandmother's many petitions, Yamantov was restored to his former regiment, the prestigious lifeguards for SARS. This would mean that he would once more be based at Sarskoe Selo, near his grandmother in St. Petersburg. The nightmare of his exile 
was over. And on his return to St. Petersburg, it seemed that he was now something of a hero after his exile to the Caucasus and as someone who had dared to raise his voice in defense of uh, uh, Pushkin. He enjoyed a period of great social success and was invited to the high society salons from which he had been previously excluded. Um, but despite his triumphant reception in society, Lyamantov felt lonely and remained unhappy. He nostalgically reminisced about his idyllic childhood. He gave expression to this nostalgia and to what he called the healing memory of the Caucasus in the poem he wrote in 1838, which has become the most famous lullaby in all Russian literature. Cossack cradle song, Gazacha Kalibyalnaya Piesnya. This was also an unbroken period of great creativity. From April to December 1838, Lyamontov worked on A Hero of Our Time and on his poem, Daemon, The Demon. The Demon is Lyamontov's most famous narrative poem. He worked on it uh, for most of his adult life from 1829 uh, to 1839. The poem tells the story of the love of a fallen angel for a mortal. For many years to come, Lermontov's masterpiece would keep inspiring poets uh, such as Bloch and Pasternak, uh, painters like Vrubel himself, and composers such as Anton Rubinstein. Throughout 1838 and 1839, Lermontov uh, continued to write some of his, uh, of his most beautiful lyric poetry. This included, amongst others, Malitva, a prayer. It was inspired by and dedicated to the beautiful and recently widowed Princess Maria Sherbatova, who Lermontov fell in love with and she with him in or around 1838 and 1839. We'll now read uh, this poem. A prayer. In difficult moments of life, when sadness fills my soul, there is a miraculous prayer which I recite by heart. There is a blessed power in the music of its words, and it breathes with a strange and sacred beauty. A weight falls from my soul. My doubts are far away. I believe once more and weep, and everything becomes so light, so light. Молитва. В минуту жизни трудную Теснится в сердце грусть. Одну молитву чудную Твержу я наизусть. Есть сила благодатная В созвучьях слов живых. И дышит непонятная Святая прелесть в них. С души Как время скатится, сомненье далеко, и верится, и плачется, и так легко, легко. Throughout 1839, Lermontov was being talked of everywhere as Russia's leading poet and as the sure successor to Pushkin. He was also making his name as a first-class prose writer. But despite all the superficially glittering social success, during this period, he remained dissatisfied with what he felt was the hollowness and hypocrisy of society. This culminated in 1840 in the writing of the poem, The First of January, Kievoya Yambaria. The poem was another bitter 
and scornful attack on society and the establishment. Such was Lermontov's popularity with the editors that somehow the poem slipped past the censors and was published. Understandably enough though, it's angered and upset the aristocracy and court circles, not to mention Tsar Nicholas. An ominous development then followed. Pushkin's death had occurred three years previously, but there was still sensitivity in French circles about the poem which Lermontov had written on the death of the poet in praise of Pushkin and in condemnation of Dantes. In late 1839, a query was raised as to whether the second stanza in Lermontov's poem, which excoriated Dantes, was directed against all Frenchmen or only against Pushkin's killer. Baron de Barant, the French ambassador, decided that the lines contain no offense to the French nation and invited Lermontov to a ball at the French embassy in January 1840. His son, Ernest de Barant, turned out to be Lermontov's rival for the affections of Princess Maria Sherbatova. Because of this, Lermontov and Ernest de Barant detested each other on sight. Uh, this ball, in fact, passed off without incident. However, at a subsequent ball in February 1840, their conversation ended with Ernest de Barant challenging Lermontov to a duel, which challenge he immediately accepted. It was agreed that the duel would be fought on the 18th of February, 1840 at Chornaya the site of Pushkin's duel with Dantes. Mongo Stalipin somewhat reluctantly agreed to be Lermontov's second. And so the duel went ahead. Two simultaneous shots rang out. Lermontov fired into the air and de Barant's shot was wide. The two opponents shook hands and departed, accompanied by their seconds. But when news of the duel reached the ears of the authorities, they came down very heavily on Lermontov. He was arrested and imprisoned in the arsenal or armory guardhouse. He was then court-martialed and stripped of his rank and privileges. However, following a tearful appeal by his grandmother, he was allowed to keep his rank, though he was transferred to the Tenginsky Infantry Regiment in the Caucasus. He was only released from prison on the 20th of April, 1840, having been incarcerated uh, for five weeks. It was in March, 1840, while he was still under arrest, that a hero of our time appeared in the shops. Tsar Nicholas was furious when he read it. The Tsar was not impressed by the character of Pechorin. Such an inappropriate hero. It was with a heavy heart and full of premonition that Lermontov left St. Petersburg for the Caucasus in the spring of 1840. He joined his regiment at Fort Grozny in Chechnya in June 1840. During his second exile, he was to see action very quickly. At dawn on the 6th of July in 1840, his regiment set off on an expedition until it came to a position by the river Valeric. On the 12th of July, a bloody battle then raged all day between Russian and Chechen forces. The number of casualties on both sides was very heavy. During the battle, Lyamantov displayed great cool-headedness and bravery and was recommended for the award of the Order of St. Vladimir. The citations referred to the fact that despite the danger, this officer fulfilled his duties with admirable courage and coolness, and even flung himself on enemy positions with the first ranks of our valiant troops. 
Afterwards, Lyamantov wrote a long narrative poem about the battle of Valerik in the form of a letter to Vavara. Yakvam pichu slučajna prava. I'm writing to you, alas, by chance. In this poem, his view of the futility of war is as relevant nowadays as it was in 1840. And in October 1840, uh, Lyamatov was put in charge of a detachment of irregular soldiers. These included Cossacks, Tatars, and Kabardinians. He eventually assumed command of a total of 100 men. He fully rose to this challenge, and after the third expedition with his detachment, was once again mentioned in dispatches. He commanded the men in his cavalry detachment in an exemplary manner, always the first to ride out and the last to rest. This brave and energetic officer several times earned the congratulations of the high command. On the 30th of October, near the river Valeric, he once more displayed courageous coolness. In the margin of the dispatch, the cavalry commander in Chechnya wrote, proposed for the golden sabre to be inscribed for bravery. It might have been thought that these splendid official reports of Lermontov's bravery in the line of duty would have impressed the Tsar, but the reverse was the case. Pedantically, the Tsar pointed to the fact that in going on this mission, the disgraced officer had not been with his own regiment, but in charge of a Cossack detachment. And so the Tsar spitefully refused to award Lermontov any honor. Meanwhile, thanks to yet more energetic petitioning by his grandmother, uh, Lyamantov was granted a period of compassionate leave with effect from January 1841. The poet arrived in St. Petersburg by early February 1841. However, his leave began badly. The day after his arrival, Lyamantov accepted an invitation to a high society ball. Unexpectedly, both the Tsar and the Tsarina appeared. The Tsar's brother, who was the commanding officer of the lifeguards, at once caught sight of Lermontov. The poet had not appeared to realize that as a disgraced officer, he was barred from such occasions. He was ordered to make a furtive exit through the back door. This further act of provocation did not go down well with the Tsar and Lermontov received a peremptory order to leave the capital within 48 hours and rejoin his regiment. On the 12th of April, 1841, the day before his departure, Lermontov went to a farewell evening hosted by Yekaterina Karamzina, the widow of the great historian Nikolai Karamzin. Uh, Lermontov took the opportunity for the first time to approach Pushkin's widow, Natalie, with uh, whom he had not really previously spoken to. He had a long and earnest conversation with her and apologized for not having valued her enough before. He said that he would try to deserve her friendship upon returning to St. Petersburg. Natalia Nikolaevna, for her part, wished him well, and she later said, that she remembered their conversation for the rest of her life. It was in a very somber mood that before his departure for the Caucasus once more, Lyamatov composed his unpublishable farewell to the Russia of Tsar Nicholas in the form of eight well-known lines Prashai Yamitaya Rasia. Farewell, unwashed Russia. We will now read this poem. Farewell, unwashed Russia. Country of slaves, country of masters, and you sky blue uniforms, and you nation 
obedient to them. Perhaps behind the wall of the Caucasus, I shall hide from your Pashas, from their all-seeing eyes, from their all-hearing ears. Прощай, немытая Россия, страна рабов, страна господ. И вы, мундиры голубые, и ты им преданный народ. Быть может, за стеной Кавказа сокроюсь от твоих пашей, от их всевидящего глаза, от их before Lermontov left uh, St. Petersburg uh, for the last time in April 1841, his friend and admirer, Prince Vladimir Odoyevsky, entrusted to him an old and treasured notebook. He gave it to Lermontov in the hope that he would fill its pages with poems. The notebook was found after Lermontov's death when it was returned to Odoyevsky. It included some of the best of Lermontov's poetry. On the 15th of April, 1841, uh, Lermontov left for the Caucasus once more via Moscow. He traveled south with his friend Mongo Stolipin, who had likewise been banished to the Caucasus as a punishment for his part in Lermontov's duel with Ernest de Barond. The two friends reached Stavropol on the 9th of May, 1841. While he was waiting at Stavropol with Stalipin to join their regiment, Lyamantov wrote several poems. One of these was Vika Juadinia Nadarogo, Alone I Step Out Onto the Road. This poem was later set to music and eventually became a much loved folk song. Admiral Kolchak, the head of the short lived white government in Omsk, who was executed by the Bolsheviks in February 1920, was said to have sung this song as he was led to his execution. Well, we will now read uh, this poem. Alone, I step out onto the road. The flinty path glistens through the mist. The night is still. The wilderness is listening to God. And star calls out to star. The skies above are magical and solemn. The earth is sleeping in a pale blue glow. Why then do I feel this grief and ache inside? Do I still yearn for something? Do I regret the past? No, I expect nothing more from life. The past, I don't regret at all. I yearn for peace and freedom. I long to sleep and to forget but not with the cold sleep of the grave. My wish would be to sleep forever, so that life's force would slumber in my breast, which would gently rise and fall. So that night and day, my ears caressing, a tender voice would sing to me of love, and above me, ever green, a dark oak, would bend towards me, whispering. Выхожу один я на дорогу, Сквозь туман кремнистый путь блестит. Ночь тиха, пустыня в нем лет Богу, И звезда звездою говорит. В небесах 
торжественно и чудно Спит земля в сиянии голубом. Что же мне так больно и так трудно? Жду ли чего? Жалею ли о чем? Уж не жду от жизни ничего я, И не жаль мне прошлого ничуть. Я ищу свободы и покоя. Я бы хотел забыться и заснуть. Но не тем холодным сном могилы Я бы желал навеки так заснуть. Чтоб в груди дремали жизни силы, Чтоб дыша вздымалась тихо грудь, Чтоб всю ночь, весь день Мой слух лелея, Про любовь мне сладкий голос пел. Надо мной, чтоб вечно зеленея Темный дуб склонялся и шумел. Also at this time, Lermontov's thoughts turned to Vavara. He wondered whether he would ever see her again. In his despair, he wrote another poem to her, Son, the Dream. Vladimir Nabokov called this poem a dream within a dream, Son Vasnier. It has also been called a vision of terrifying clarity. We'll now read this poem. The Dream. In the midday heat, in a valley in Dagestan, I lay motionless, a bullet in my chest. Vapor was still rising from my deep wound as my blood oozed out drop by drop. Alone, I lay on the sand, craggy cliffs crowded all around. Their yellow peaks were scorching in the sun and I scorched too, but I slept the sleep of the dead. And I dreamed of glittering lights of an evening feast in my homeland, where young women, garlanded with flowers, merrily talked about me. But one sat apart from the lively talk, lost in thought, and her young soul, God alone knows why, was immersed in the saddest dream. And she dreamt of a valley in Dagestan, and the dead body lying there, of the person who was so dear to her. Vapor rising, a black wound gaping in his chest, as his blood streamed out, growing cold. Son. В полдневный жар в долине Дагестана С свинцом в груди лежал недвижим я. Глубокая еще дымилась рана, По капле кровь сочилась моя. Лежал один я на песке долины, Уступ искал, теснились и кругом. И солнце жгло их желтые вершины, И жгло меня, но спал я мертвым сном. И снился мне сияющий огнями Вечерний пир в родимой стране. Меж юных жен 
увенчанных цветами, шел разговор веселый обо мне. Но в разговор веселый, не вступая, сидела там задумчиво одна. И в грустный сон душа ее молодая, Бог знает, чем была погружена. И снилась ей долина Дагестана, знакомый труп лежал в долине той, в его груди дымясь чернела рана, и кровь лилась холодеющей струей. Uh, Lyamantov and Stolipin then continued with their journey to their posting in Dagestan. Lyamantov suddenly became taken uh, with the notion of going to Pyatigorsk instead and managed to persuade a rather reluctant Stolipin that they should decide the matter by tossing a coin in a manner worthy of his own short story, Fatalist, the Fatalist. Lyamantov put it as follows. Heads, we rejoin our regiment. Tails, we go to Pyatigorsk. Agreed? Stolypin agreed reluctantly. The coin came up tails. Lyamantov leapt into the air, joyfully shouting, to Pyatigorsk, to Pyatigorsk, to Pyatigorsk, to Pyatigorsk. They reached Pyatigorsk on the 13th of May. The two rented a small four-roomed house on the outskirts of the town, facing the slopes of Mount Mashuk. It was here that soon after, Lyamantov wrote his insightful and bitter poem, Prarok, the Prophet. He also saw a number of his old friends in Pyatigorsk. Kornet Glyabov, uh, Prince Gagarin the painter, uh, Prince Sergei Trubetskoy, uh, Lev Pushkin, uh, Pushkin's younger brother, and not least, his oldest friend of all, Nikolai Martinov. Lermontov was also delighted to renew his acquaintance with the Verzilin family. Madame Verzilin's home was a veritable magnet for the best society in the spa and was known as the Shrine of the Three Graces, thanks to her three pretty daughters. But Lermontov was by no means popular in all quarters. The town was soon divided into two camps, the friends of the poet and his enemies. His friends tended uh, to include exiles like himself and the younger women. His enemies tended to be more on the establishment side. Against Lermontov's own expectation, Martinov was very much in the enemy's camp. Martinov had been in the Caucasus for two years. He had originally hoped to become a general, but decorations had not come his way. He had retired from the army, a disillusioned and envious man. He was also pretentious and at the same time, somewhat slow-witted. Martinov made uh, things worse for himself by going native in the style which Lermontov had parodied in his essay, Kavkaziets, or Caucasian. He tended to dress for effect in Circassian style and carried the largest dagger a silversmith could make. He had not improved his looks by shaving his head like a Tatar. Lermontov mercilessly teased Martinov about his dress. He referred to him in humorous and deprecatory terms, hey, voilà le montagnard au grand poignard. Here he comes, the hill tribesman with the huge dagger. On the more positive side, Lermontov was overjoyed to find his cousin Yekaterina Bichavietz staying with an aunt in the town, and he spent many happy hours with her. It should be said that Lermontov loved her, and not so much for herself, 
but because she was uncannily like Lavara. Lermontov wrote her a poem in which he expressed his appreciation of this resemblance. This was perhaps Lermontov's last poems. Niet, niet bien, tak pilka ya lublu. No, it's not you I love so passionately. Meanwhile, resentment of the poet in the anti Lermontov camp continued to grow. Matters finally came to a head on the 13th of July, 1841. Lermontov, Martinov and their friends were spending the evening at the Versilins. Prince Trubetskoy was playing waltzes at the piano. Lermontov then took some chalk and with a few death strokes, drew a brilliant caricature of Martinov with his long dagger. Lev Pushkin burst out laughing. Prince Trubetskoy stopped playing. Just at that very moment, Lermontov's voice, saying the word dagger, resounded in the silence of the room. No doubt he had once more been ironically referring to the Montagnard, au Grand Poignard. Martinov was incensed by this and told Lermontov that he had had enough of his sarcasm. They continued to argue for some time and then Martinov challenged Lermontov to a duel, which the poet accepted. Their friends didn't really think at first that the duel would actually go ahead. However, Martinov refused to back down. It was settled that the duel should be fought on the 15th of July at 6.30 in the evening at the foot of Mount Mashuk. It's believed that Lermontov's uh, seconds were Mongo Stalipin and Prince Vasilchikov, and that Martinov's seconds were Mikhail Glebov and Prince Trubetskoy. Lermontov spent the first part of the day on the 15th of July with his cousin Katya Bikhavets. When parting, he said to her, Kuzina Dushinka, my dearest cousin, there won't be a happier moment than this in the whole of my life. And on the way to the site of the duel, Lermontov was in a cheerful mood. He remarked to Mikhail Glebov that his one regret was that he could not retire from the army. He had worked out the plots of a trilogy of novels, which he had hoped one day to write which would have as their settings, first, Catherine the Great and the, uh, the Pugachev Rebellion, secondly, uh, Napoleon's invasion, and thirdly, the present war in the Caucasus. On arrival at the foot of Mount Mashuk, Lermontov and Martinov started pre preparing with their seconds. Lermontov then remarked to Vasilchikov in a loud voice, so that Martinov could not help but hear, I won't fire at that fool. This was bound to incite Martinov. Lyamantov and Martinov then took up position. They were barely 30 short paces apart. Lyamantov stood motionless. His pistol pointed towards the sky. His other arm lay across his chest. It was absolutely clear that he had decided not to fire. Martinov advanced towards him. He couldn't bring himself to look Lermontov in the eye, but he held his pistol leveled at Lermontov's chest. Beside himself, Stalipin suddenly roared, fire or else I'll separate you. Martinov then came to the barrier with quick strides and fired. As though struck down by lightning, Lermontov fell to the ground without even swaying or clutching at his wound. He breathed softly three times, did not utter a single groan and died instantly. The seconds were horrified and rushed towards him. A gaping wound showed in his back and blood was gushing through a hole in his chest. 
the vision of terrifying clarity, which had appeared in his poem, The Dream, had materialized. Vapor rising, a black wound gaping in his chest as his blood streamed out, growing cold. Lermontov's body was eventually brought back to Piatigorsk. It was long after midnight by the time Dr. Barclay de Tolly arrived to register the death. The funeral took place in Piatigorsk uh, three days later on the 18th of July. Death by dueling was considered a suicide, so a church service was not possible. But the funeral was conducted with the rites and ceremonial due to a Christian soldier. The whole town attended the funeral. Representatives of all four regiments in which Lermontov had served acted as pallbearers. The coffin was carried to a secluded grave in the cemetery at the foot of Mount Mashuk, near the place where the duel had been fought. When the Tsar was told of Lermontov's death, he is reputed to have explained, to have exclaimed, Sabakye Sabacha Smirt, a dog's death for a dog. The Tsar's sister, the Grand Duchess of Weimar, when she heard what her brother had said, was so horrified that she forced the Tsar to retract it. He then came back to declare in front of his courtiers, gentlemen, the man who could have taken Pushkin's place for us has been killed. Vavara Lapukina was so distressed by Lermontov's death that she was confined to bed for two weeks. She never got over Mikhail's death. For the rest of her life, Vavara was bitterly unhappy and suffered appalling health. She only lived uh, for another 10 years and died at the age of 36 in 1851. It was nearly a month before anyone dared to tell Elizaveta Alexeyevna of her grandson's death. The news of this had a devastating effect on her. She never recovered from the shock. Indeed, she was so devastated by the news of her grandson's death that she wept so much that her eyelids permanently closed so that she could only open her eyes by lifting up her eyelids with her hands or fingers. However, her petitioning to the Tsar was not yet over. Lizaveta Alexeyevna had one more request to make, that her grandson's body should be removed from the Piatigorsk cemetery and placed in the family vault at the Tarkhani estate. This time, the request was not refused. The coffin containing Lermontov's body arrived at Tarkhani on the 23rd of April, 1842, and was laid to rest in the family tomb next to his mother and grandfather. Many Russian poets have died before their time. <clears throat> Pushkin, Bloch, Mayakovsky, Gumilyov, Yesenin, Mandelstam, Svetaeva, to name but a few. The death of Lermontov at the age of 26 seems especially wasteful. It leaves an overwhelming sense of unfulfilled potential, the thwarted promise of still greater things to come. Civic and philosophical themes, as well as deeply personal motifs, were closely interwoven in Lermontov's poetry. His legacy can be found in the works of Russian writers, artists and composers, and in theatrical and cinematic productions. His dramatic life has itself served as material for many novels, poems, plays, and films. By way of concluding, 
And before we read our final poem, I'd like to read two excerpts from articles by literary critics. The first is an excerpt from the article Lermontov by the famous literary critic Yuli Eichenwald. There are people who all their lives represent an irreconcilable contradiction and sound a fatal dissonance. Lermontov started with this, but did not end with this. He started with Byron, but ended with Pushkin. Throughout his short life, Lermontov gravitated towards spiritual peace, towards wondrous simplicity, and he had to make a lot of effort to find beauty and depth in simple things. And through his constant striving, he eventually found them. In the wisdom of his heart, he grasped the religious meaning of life. He understood that the simple is not vulgar, that it is easier to soar beautifully over the peaks of the Caucasus than in the mundane valleys of life, modestly and industri industriously to live one's everyday life. For a long time, he asked for storms and sultry storms really did rage in his chest. But after they had swept by and Lermontov had come home where wonderful simplicity awaited him, after that, he was killed and he was not destined to live at home. And now, like the hero of his poem, Testament, he bows to his native land from his tragic grave and his native land lovingly responds to its singer and son. The second uh, quotation is from Vasily Rozanov. Lermontov creates a series of genuine prayers, original and creative, but not imitative. His poems, such as Alone I Step Out Onto the Road, and an angel, was, an, an, an angel was flying through the midnight sky, are original and personal hymns. His hymns are tense, passionate, and restless, and at the same time, airy and starry. All of his lyrics as a whole, and each poem separately, represent a synthesis of his deepest personal feelings which belong to him exclusively, but which immediately expand into vast panoramas. There is no poet more cosmic and more personal. Let us celebrate the fact that the spirit of Lermontov lives on through his wonderful verse and prose, which continue to speak to us today. We will end uh, the evening by reading a poem by Bulat Akujava, which links the tragic deaths of Pushkin and Lermontov with the equally tragic fates of Russian poets of the 20th century. Berigichinas, Boetov. Berigichinas. Take care of us poets. Take Care of Us Poets by Bulat, Bulat Akujava. Take care of us poets. Take care of us. We have only a century left. A year, a week, an hour, three minutes, two minutes, no time at all. Take care of us. But remember, all for one, one for all. Take care of us with our sins and joys and without. Our own Dantes is wandering close by, young and handsome. He cannot forget his past damnation, but his destiny is to push the bullet into the barrel. Our Martinov is crying somewhere. He remembers the spilt blood. He is already killed once. He does not want to kill again. But his fate has ordained it, and the lead is cast, 
and the 20th century orders him to fire. Take care of us while there's still time. Only do not take care of us so we perish, like the care that Tsar's servants took of his hounds, or the Tsar took of his dog handlers. Protect us, poets, from dirty hands, from unjust sentences and shallow girlfriends. There will be many more poems and many songs for you. But please, take care of us poets. Take care of us. Bulat Akudjava. Берегите нас, поэтов, берегите нас. Остается век, полвека, год, неделя, час, три минуты, две минуты, вовсе ничего. Берегите нас, но только все за одного. Берегите нас с грехами, с радостью и без. Где-то юный и прекрасный бродит наш Дантес. Он минувшие проклятия не успел забыть, Но велит ему призвание пулю в ствол забить. Где-то плачет наш Мартынов, Поминает кровь, он уже убил однажды, он не хочет вновь, но судьба его такая, и свинец отлит, и двадцатое столетие так ему велит. Берегите нас, покуда можно уберечь. Только так не берегите, чтоб костьми нам лечь. Только так не берегите, как борзых псари. Только так не берегите, как псарей цари. Берегите нас, поэтов, от дурацких рук. От нелепых приговоров, от слепых подруг Будут вам стихи и песни, и еще не раз. Только вы нас берегите, берегите нас. Uh, that is the end of our uh, presentation and reading, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we'd be very happy to, um, to answer any questions you may have or comments, if you wish. Thank you, David. It was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Sorry, who is that speaking? Uh, Carolina. No, it's Natasha Dickinson. Uh, oh, sorry, Natasha. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Yes. It well, was absolutely uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. Well, I think all three of us, um, we do really appreciate um, Lermontov. Alla, of course, has known him from childhood, but Lucy and I were chatting earlier, and um, I think for myself, Lermontov was the first... Um, Russian poets who, more, to start with, more than Pushkin even, who um, resonated. And um, I found his, his verse so easy to memorize and um, I found it absolutely entrancing. I mean, there are other poems we, we would love to have uh, read as well, but um, you have to make a selection. I think Nietzsche near Byron was the first one I learned, but I was still a child. I was a teenager. Oh, sorry. I that, just so you know. I'd, um, I'd, I'm not on the video. I just wanted 
Um, my name is Joyce Glasser. I just wanted to thank you for that excellent presentation. It was really great uh, to um, get the context. I had read some of the poems before, but uh, didn't know the context, and that makes a lot of difference. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I just didn't get the name of the author of that, of the last poem, uh, Take Care of Us Poets. Oh, Boulat. Yes, of course. Um, Boulat Akujava, uh, what, uh, who was a, a great singer as well as a poet. Oh, okay. B-U-L-A-T. Not, not singer. He was performed his poems singing. Yes, okay, but he sang. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, they, they call it a bard in Russia. Yeah, a bard, exactly. Yes. Bard. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, he's got a beautiful, his voice is absolutely beautiful. And, um, well, again, just a personal account. When I started studying Russian, I found the pronunciation difficult. And one of my first teachers uh, recommended that I listen to the songs of, um, or, or to Bullet Akujava singing. And I found... Um, the clarity of his diction and the the melodiousness of his voice um absolutely um compelling so if you can you can easily get his um some of his uh, recordings and it's it's a delight to the ear and and to the mind and to the soul to, to listen to him thank you but your point is is very good i mean the one theory about poetry is you you dissect and analyze the, the text and consider it on its own. But really, um, I think with all poetry, it, it does help and it enriches one's understanding and appreciation. If you know that it, it, it stands to reason, if, if a particular poem was uh, addressed to a particular woman, in, in, in some cases, who, who Lermontov had been in love with, it, it helps to appreciate um, the, the meaning and the, the sense of, of the poem, and especially when it's not uh, totally straightforward, as, as will have appeared. Um, the account of his personal life, I mean, is hardly, he's, he was hardly a saint. Um, and I hope that came through, that, um, that the, some of the treatment was atrocious. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, I, I thought it important to, um, to draw attention to his incredible courage in battle, by the way, he was totally opposed to, to warfare. Um, it's one of these strange things. He had direct experience of combat. He was fearless and re obviously reckless with his own life as he showed with um, his attitude to dueling. He didn't need to go ahead with that. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's very un 21st century, the, the behavior of such an individual, which I, I find absolutely riveting. And it, for me, it is, tra it is truly tragic that he did not live longer because, um, say, those three works I mentioned that he was hoping to write um, would have been wonderful. By the way, uh, I'd have loved to have said more about A Hero of Our Time. I, I reread it um, in English translation uh, for, before this talk, and it is, it is utterly gripping. And it's... What I found astonishing was for someone so young in his mid twenties to have written such a work. It just shows such a deep level of understanding of human nature. Um, but it is, and so there are some quite good translations, and you can appreciate the um, the story and the the ironic um, self awareness of of the hero. Uh, or the the protagonist rather. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. It was amazing. Oh, thank uh, you. Can I say something? Oh, Lydia. Hello. Dobry uh, I think it is just super. So so good. Не хотелось бы только сказать, что это можно напечатать. You have to publish it because we have to 
I, I see many of us want just to take it and read it again and go deeper and deeper because in Russia we learn it from childhood. So we were absolutely open for that and we remember it still. But now in these ages, well, you, it is different understanding, but it is absolutely marvelous. And I thought it could be published. You have so many lectures and this reading, absolutely beautiful. So it, it's not just for one hour and a half or one hour to read and forget, because it, it should be just with you all the time. Oh, well, no, thank you, Lydia. But um, Pushkin House, they, they put it on, they publish it, these talks. Uh, we've got several of these poetry sessions and they are, uh, uh, they are all published on YouTube, the Pushkin House YouTube site. So you can oh. see them. And I'm very happy for my, um, well, I, I think it's very important to circulate the text, both yes. of the originals, by the way, as mm -hmm. well as the translations. Um, so that so it's it's available in that sense permanently. But I I am hoping at some stage uh, to to publish something, um, a collection of um, of, of uh, talks about um, Russian poets with with the original poetry and the the translations um, it, it might be of, of, of interest to people i think it is it is uh, the hard copy is just very, very precious yes but um but also i find with um Lermontov, we have um uh, celebrated his life and work on previous occasions as well and um we, we come back to him from time to time and each time we, we we all find, well, I certainly find it, and I think Lucy does, um, that we we understand more each time, um, and and see different layers and levels in the in the poetry. So it isn't just a one-off at all. It's um, it it remains with one, and it it's inspirational. It, it is inspirational poetry, I think. Absolutely. If I, if I could just say one. Uh, Add one more thing. I um, when you were, I, I totally get the argument between um, you know, the T. S. Eliot that you should not use context and just to analyze. But actually, uh, I I refute that. And um, but uh, in terms of uh, Lermontov, he seems to have had a, a definite self-destructive streak. Um, you know, with his university. Uh, I mean, how can you go to one change universities without even knowing if your former one will be, your credits will be accepted? It's ridiculous. And then, you know, and then with uh, join, if he's a pacifist, joining the military and then fighting duels and everything. And I was wondering if that, if, <laughs> if the duel thing had anything to and then also I mean at the very end flipping a coin to desert your regiment and go somewhere else and have fun drinking I mean I, I it's unbelievable he'd get into trouble for that again but did his dueling have anything to do with with his his Pushkin and the Pushkin in the comparison that he was the the next Pushkin do you think in the, somewhere in the back of his his mind I don't know I, well, but one can speculate. I, I, I yeah. would agree with all those comments. Yes, there was a, there was certainly a self-destructive um, uh, uh, element in his, um, in his makeup. Absolutely. Um, but he, he did not behave in a. Say, I mean, it's the opposite, perhaps, of a career civil servant who would apply, who would do his or her exams. <laughs> and then apply to a particular post and then work hard and um, and be respectful to their seniors and not be late for interviews and this sort of thing and would would not take reckless risks but I mean, he, he was the, the absolute antithesis of that yeah which is what makes him in many ways so appealing but yeah. but not a not a role model because certainly his treatment um his treatment of um of women, I, I mean, well, I, I don't want to go, go too much into this, but it's obvious it, it leaves a lot to be desired. Um, what, how much of that is explicable by his upbringing? I mean, he may have been somewhat spoilt by his grandmother, 
uh, when he was brought up on her estate and he lost his mother and father at an early age. But the, I'm simply not qualified to sort of um, probe no. into the, the, the Freudian antecedents of, um, <laughs> of his yeah. subsequent behavior. But Alla is far more knowledgeable about these things. And Alla, you may wish to comment on that. Is there anything more to say than just judging him by his actions? Sorry, I, I was lost in my own thoughts. I... <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Okay, no, thanks, Joyce. Where, where are you joining us from, Joyce, by the way? Oh, London. London. Oh, London, I see. Yeah, yes, from... but I, I don't know Russian. I'm just interested in uh, poetry and, and literature. Yeah. Fine, yes. But by the way, can I just say this? Thanks to Zoom and thanks to again to Pushkin House by broadcasting these um, or, or transmitting these talks. It, we have attracted comments from um, from other countries, from people who appreciate poetry. We had a very nice comment on one of our talks. I think yeah. uh, from all over the world. By the well, way. from Brazil and then from a Chile, from, a, <laughs> from an American who lives in Sydney, Roger Pulvers who is the leading uh, commentator in, in Australia on Japanese culture. Hmm. Um, and I've been in correspondence with him. He's, he translates Russian and Polish as well as Japanese. Wow. But he is, he is a wonderful man and he is very interested in, if you like, I suppose you'd call it cross-cultural fertilization, cross-cultural issues. And um, I've learned an awful lot from him yeah, and he translated uh, Ahmatova and Yesenin also. Oh yes, he's tra he's translated many poets into yeah, and Svetayeva, yeah. Yes. I mean he would he would he's assured me he would attend these events, but his the time difference is it would just be absolutely the, the wrong sort of time. But he will he told me he was waiting to watch this when it goes out on YouTube. And he won't hesitate to make critical comments, I'm sure, if um if there's anything that he finds unbecoming. Is, is Dennis still around, by the way? Yes, I am. I oh, oh, fine, fine. Okay, yes. I, I think for future talks, it would be good to mute every, everyone. Yes, I've done that, but, but too late. I'm sorry about that. That's all right, yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you. Um, oh, Roger, good evening. Hello, good to see you. Thank you and, and Lucy and Ella for a wonderful performance this evening and the whole event I found most beautiful and memorable. And I'm very glad to hear that you're thinking of um, producing some sort of um, collection of these talks that we can enjoy again. <laughs> ask a question. Yes, of course. Puzzled about um, one aspect of Yermontov um, as to whether he had any real um, religious beliefs. Um, he, his conduct suggests that he didn't, but some of his poetry does seem to reflect a belief in God and, and a belief in, 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 in a, a, a good, goodness. And on, on his religious and moral believe deep down that's a very good question I, I i honestly don't know i've thought about this um i mean the, the poem um angle the angel i understand from Allah was not um was not permitted during the soviet time is that right uh, no it, it was it has been published but it hadn't been mentioned at school oh i see yeah. School children uh, had no uh, idea. Well, okay, but say taking the angel, um, I, I don't want to sound pretentious, Roger, but I, uh, for me, I, uh, when I first discovered it, I thought it's the most beautiful expression of the notion of the, or the, the contrast between the real world and the ideal world. And that the, 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 the real world we live in is, is imperfect and, and cannot be any sort there cannot be any comparison between that and the ideal world which we'd all love to have and so i i regard that as um it, it could be platonic idealism i mean i don't think he was a philosopher in that sense i 
I, I, so I honestly don't know if it was that or there was some Christian belief. I think it's, it's ambiguous. Do you, do you know, Anna, if he was a believer? Uh, I just, uh, if anybody wants to know, to just to know more about Lermontov's uh, relation, <laughs> relation with, with God, I recommend to read the article by Merishkovsky, Lermontov Poet Sverchlovichstva. It is on the internet. I'm not sure that it had been translated into English, but in Russian, if you just click on Merishkovsky, then Lermontov Dash Poet Sverchlovichstva, then uh, it will un I think will answer the questions of whether Lermontov was religious or just was fighting the uh, religion and uh, also about his development in the philosophical and the religious. Uh, okay. Methods. Well, Roger, yes. when we meet, Roger, let's compare notes on that. But ca can you um, enlighten us any further as to the conclusion one would then draw from that? Or are you just leaving it to us, Allah, to? decipher it for us no, but uh, i just it's so it's uh, expressed so beautifully and uh, it can't be said in two or three words so okay I know. It's, and uh, it's uh, it places a great uh Merishkovsky places great uh, um, um, waiting i would have said on that kazachi kalibelne the cossacks uh, lullaby that uh, so his conclusion okay is that learned of uh, uh, was uh, reconciled with God through the mother of God. I see, yeah. Because he has that uh, Cossack lullaby and also the beautiful another Malitva. Ya Mater Boja Nenis Malitva. Mother of God, I am now uh, um, addressing you with, with my uh, uh, prayer. Okay, no, thank you. Well, no, definitely. That, well, that's this is how one, by giving a talk, one then learns new things. Um, I will definitely look that up. And I Actually, look, uh, yes. can I say something? Of course, Jennifer, I, yes. I, I've got here uh, something that I photocopied from a book by Leslie Blanche, and she refers to Merejowski, who takes a, a romantic view, writing of Lermontov's profound love of nature, he develops his theme that Lermontov was not all man, that he was part angel, part devil, a wandering, dispossessed soul who craved some earthly anchor, who knew himself doomed to centuries of past and future disembodied wanderings, tormented by some sort of prenatal memory, a vision or remembrance of eternity. I have lost count of my years, wrote Lermontov at 15, posing romantically. But was it entirely a fashionable pose? Again and again in his writing, he returns to this theme, to those shadowy, mysterious remembrances of another existence, of some immemorial past from which he would like to escape forever into the world of positive horizons. And he also recalls, well, Merejowski says, he recalls the Gnostic legend of which Dante speaks in the Divine Comedy establishing a link between celestial world and our own. That angels who've made their choice between the two camps have no need to be born. Sorry, do you want me to go on? Shall no, I no, carry on. This is very interesting. Uh, time cannot change their decision, taken for all eternity. But for those who hesitate, who cannot choose between light and shadow, God has accorded a grace, that of being born into the world, so that they can make in man's time, in man's time, the choice they could not make in God eternity. These angels are the souls of the newborn. The same grace which brought them to birth hides from them the eternal past, so that their hesitations and doubts in the past do not influence or determine in advance their decisions during that earthly sojourn in which they must decide their salvation or perdition in the eternal future to which they will return. There's more, but I, you know, I don't want to monopolize everyone's time, but it's quite interesting actually, this yeah. bit that she quotes. 
Yes, and sorry, where, where was that from, Jennifer? It's, um, it's from Sabres in Paradise uh, by yes. Leslie Blanche, which is about the Caucasian Wars, which actually Georgian told me were utter, were utter rubbish. Uh, I mean, if you'd like, I can photocopy it and send it to you if you've got an email address or something. Oh, yes, I would. I would, yes. Um, uh, no, absolutely, Jennifer, I would very much like that. What is um, the title again, please? Uh, the book is Sabres in Paradise. It's by an author called Leslie Blanche. Thank you. Um, but as I say, I, when I was in the Caucasus and speaking to people there, they said that actually a lot of what she wrote was rubbish and inaccurate and so on. But, you know, I, I don't have any Russian and I can only speak, you know, I can only read things in English. But I th I, this bit struck me very, very much when I was reading reading it because I just read Leonard at the um, Lawrence Kelly's biography of Leonard Hoff. Yes. Oh, that's uh, very good. Yes. So I, I was really very, very interested in this. But I mean, if you would like to send me your email address, or perhaps I can send it to your care of Pushkin House, if that would be easy. I've just sent it to you. Jennifer. Oh, right. OK. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, at all. No, thank you. That's, um, that's very interesting indeed. Well, no, because I, I think um, I think Lermontov will always be one of my main interests um, in 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 Russian poetry. It really will. He really will. Um, I mean, for all the reasons we've we've given tonight. Mm, mm. That's why oh. it's been such a good talk because it it's so nice to have things put into context. I mean, you know, one reads about it, but it's nice to have things particularly pointed up, I think. And no, that's for publishing the poems, because, you know, you have to read them again to sort of get the full... Of course, to, yes. To try and get somewhere near the heart of them. No, that's very kind. In fact, uh, well, absolutely, because I wasn't... Um, I'm, not an, I'm not an expert on of, of, of any of these things, but I, I simply love Russian poetry, and my passion is to communicate that love to well, others well, who are have, interested. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to um and and to go through the things which which people often overlook they by focusing on one particular aspect of a writer yes and then just to to, to bring these things together and it by the way it's a fascinating i i know this story quite well but even preparing for this evening i i was just entranced by it i thought this is absolutely <laughs> extraordinary and it, I mean, I'd love to go to the to Pietigorsk and to oh, go so to would I, so would I. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but I would also actually like to have um, a really good exposition of his poem, "The Demon." Oh yes I, yes, I feel that when I've read it, I miss so much because I'm not au fait with all the mythology and. The religious thinking that goes into all that and I would really love to be able to explore that more. Well I think you know, you're absolutely right that that sort of um you would need a, a separate talk devoted. Yes to I, I, I quite understand this. Oh no no. Deal but, in but, talk like this. Yeah yeah um or for the hero of our time the hero of our time which uh, I think is is fantastic is a fantastic work um yes the po by the way the poems I, I do believe in um I, I also believe very much in showing the text of the original and and one's own translations. It's incredibly difficult to translate Russian poetry. I'm sure. I'm sure. I mean, Anthony Wood, I know, is here tonight, who is is the outstanding translator of Pushkin in the English speaking world. And um, I I find Pushkin excruciatingly difficult to translate. Anthony does it with immaculate precision and delicacy. But somehow I found Lermontov, I'm not claiming any special credit for the, uh, the translations, but I hope that at least they give, they give some idea of the original. Mm. Um, I mean, the angel is very difficult to, to translate into anything like the same sort of form. But um, I, I somehow find Lermontov easier to translate than, say, Pushkin. Um, but, but others can judge. And, and you, you can then dissect. I, I'm always willing to, <laughs> Anthony and I have discussed translations many times, and, and Lucy and I have discussed them together. Um, it's always very interesting to, to have others' views on the, um, the way in which, in fact, and Star calls out to Star, I should say it was Anthony who gave me that, that phrase. I, I, I can't claim credit for having, I think it's just a beautiful phrase in, in 
alone I walk out on the path um, and star calls out to star just that for me, that is such just it just resonates in such a poetic way. But it was Anthony who gave me that as the the best translation of the of the Russian. Did you wish to comment, Anthony? I I don't wish to force you. Okay, you're muted. Muted. Uh, can Can you hear me now? Oh, we can yes. hear you now. Yes. 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 D David, I've been trying to unmute myself for the last half hour. Um, <laughs> that, 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 very unusual. That, um, thank you very much for. Um, I'm actually overwhelmed. That, that's another reason why I couldn't, I didn't chip in before. Um, I found what you have um, presented very moving and very, um, it put together so much. W one has read m many well-known poems by Lermontov and sat back in one's romantic chair and, and w w w um, wallowed in romanticism. But you have put uh, the the living context of, of, of uh, how these poems were, were written. I, I had no idea of the extent to which you brought out that Lermontov um, acted so much against his own interests. Mm. You know, uh, he, he didn't yes. turn up for exams, and so on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <laughs> and uh, no, this, this is, uh, I, I just didn't realize that. Um, and he even, uh, like, rather like Pushkin, didn't take duels seriously. Um, and he, uh, the final duel, he was aimed up in the air. And Pushkin, most of Pushkin's duels that, that, that he um, started, um, he, he didn't intend to do properly, that they were almost a joke. Um, so this is a curious um, gambling instinct that, that we seem yes. to see in a number of Russians uh, for some reason, I don't know. I ended up with the feeling from your um, wonderful riveting talk, um, David, that, that I've been men maybe spending too much time on Pushkin and I should now turn to Lermontov. Um, very difficult, as, as you say, maybe impossible to translate in, into riveting English for, for the reader today. I don't know. Oh, but, I think... Yeah, I, I, in short, I was inspired by your talk. Oh, well, God, that's, that's high praise. Now, Anthony, do, it, as I say, I, I, would, uh, I would really say this. You have, um, you have translated Pushkin to a very high level. Um, I, I think you should be able to deal with Lermontov. I can't remember where you, where you got star from star from. I can't remember that. It was from you. Star from to you. star. Oh. And star calls out to star. Okay. It, it's, it was not in relation to that particular poem because it's, it's repeated in, in a Dombrovsky poem. And I, I think you, ah. cor you, you gave, I'm sure you gave me that. Um, uh, oh, you, did you show me translations of Dombrowski? Yes, yes, I think yes. so, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. No, but we're all, I think you used the phrase, we're all toilers in the vineyard. So it's, yes, yes. it's a cooperative enterprise. Yes, okay. I got that from um, the famous translator of Yevgeny and Yekin, um, but before Stanley. No, I've forgotten his name, actually. The famous translator of Anyekin before Stanley Mitchell. Oh, well, there are, there are so many. <laughs> not, no, not no, no, there's only one, one. One. No, Vladimir Nabokov. No! <laughs> <laughs> Joking. No, no, I knew I'd be lighting the blue touch paper with that. One forgets <laughs> names. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. um... Stanley um, <laughs> No, Stan, before Stanley Mitchell. Um, <laughs> Now, I, I recently was asked to recommend to um, a friend of Roger Pulver's in Australia, who was giving a talk about um, Yevgeny Onegin, yes. uh, to list the, the best translations. So I did. I gave him about six. In, in, I, I gave Vladi, Vladimir Nabokov's, I gave um, Stanley Mitchell's, I gave Roger Clark's, and I gave... Charles Johnston. Charles, Charles Johnston, Johnston, yes. Yeah. Yes. His, his was the phrase, we toil, we all toil in the same vineyard. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say that's the best translation of... Um, no, I didn't. I said the again. before Stanley. Yeah, I knew before Stanley, yeah. yeah. No, but fine. But yes, that... Um, I think that self-destructive streak that Joyce uh, Glasser uh, referred to, that, that, that is a, 
a feature of Lermontov more than with Pushkin. Certainly, I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't have said Pushkin had a self-destructive streak in the same way at all. Mm -hmm. I know this is completely off the thing, but I, I remember when I was, when I did first read um, Lermontov in the Russian and I read Hero of Our Time and I fell in love with Pichorin before I ever fell in love with any human. Um, and I was a teenager and um, I, I saw him, I saw Lermontov as a kind of, uh, a kind of self-destructive rock star, star, you know, who takes too many drugs but makes the most brilliant music. Mm. And the really weird thing is many, many, many years later, when um, Divine Amy Winehouse died age 27, I remember immediately thinking of Lermontov because I always remember 1814 to 1841. So you said he was 26, but in my mind he had been 27. So there we are. I compare him to rock stars and Amy Winehouse and just extraordinary genius and yet extraordinary self-destructive impulses as well. Yeah. I'd agree with that. I, I, I On that note, I'm afraid I have to go, although I'm one of the hosts. So I bid yeah. you all a... No, thanks, Lucy. <laughs> Wonderful to see you in such great form. See you soon, I hope, in London. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. In Wonderful. person, as they say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bye, bye. Bye. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Yes, sir. I think it wasn't self-destruction because they didn't want to be in the uh, straight jacket. It is just the sense of freedom and passion. Yeah. Didn't no, know no. that we, this end like that. But they wanted to protest. And they were very passionate. It is, it, that's why it's a lot of music about it. They all put on, on the music, on lyrics. Yeah, okay, no, thank you. Um, Dennis, shall we um, shall we bring things to a close? Do you think? Um, I mean, I feel that the conversation is so dynamic and lively and exciting yeah. that it's a pity to finish it. Oh well, let's uh, carry on then. Let's carry. I didn't want to curtail it. Yeah, it's good. Well, let's see if there are any more comments, perhaps. Oh, uh, sorry, it's me again. I've got to go too, but I wanted to just ask you, I know I can listen to it now on YouTube, but uh, what was the short story you you said that inspired Tolstoy? Oh, the poem. It, it was a poem. Oh, A I poem see. on the Battle of Borodino. Okay. Short poem. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a poem. It's called Borodino about the battle and that inspired uh, Tolstoy to write War and Peace ah. in which of course the Battle of Borodino is is one of the great events in War and Peace. Yeah oh okay so he wasn't inspired just by the battle but by the poem about the battle. Uh, well he might I, one can't say it was only that I mean he, he it was <laughs> yeah. a huge uh, a huge issue um the, the Napoleonic invasion for, for Russia, um, yeah. a, an existential issue. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Joyce, for all those comments. Um, it's very helpful to have these, um, I mean, these, these sorts of comments and, uh, and questions. Because on Zoom, of course, one doesn't know, one can't sense how the audience is is reacting at any stage. Um, well, your presentation was very, I liked so much the way you spoke at a great pace for people listening to new information and, and you articulated because over the past year, I've listened to many, many Zoom talks and some of them I've just stopped listening to because the uh, people, professors and with loads of titles after their names, they just don't know how to talk to people uh, and they mumble and they put their voice down and whatever. But your talk was very clear and I appreciate that. Well, that's no, incredibly helpful to have that. No, it, it is an issue. One has to, one, I'm conscious of that because I, I do a lot of Zoom uh, meetings and it is, it is an issue. Um, so that's helpful to have that feedback. Um, oh, there's a question uh, re recommending a, a hero of our time. 
um, from Patricia Davis. Well, the the penguin uh, version that I have, which I, I found very good, is by Paul Foot. Uh, Paul Foot. That's F O O T E. Published by Penguin um, in 19, well 1966. It was first published. It was uh, reprinted in 1985. Mm -hmm. So that I found that um, perfectly serviceable. I found that a, a pretty good, um, and I, ha I have compared it with the original. But that's certainly one I know, but um, I'm, I'm sure there are others. Uh, hello, good evening. Oh, hello, Yaroslav. Yeah, hello, good evening. Good evening. <laughs> I Thank tried to be connected previously, but... Yes, yes, yes. Yes, love. Uh, thanks for coming. <laughs> thanks for coming. I just yes. pressed the button mute and now I, I can see that I can be heard. Yes, you can so, be heard. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Thank you to you, David, for organizing this event and to Allah for her beautiful presentation. I love Lermonta very much. Lermontov and Dostoevsky are my favorite from Russian classic. And uh, I believe, I actually disagree uh, with uh, saying um, that Lermontov was self-destructed. I believe that in poems, in, Lerm uh, in poems of Lermontov, you can find more um, food, uh, spiritual food, yes. Uh, yes. rather than in poems of Pushkin. Uh, I believe this is my opinion. Uh, he was uh, really spiritual, and he understood very well the nature of demon, as uh, you can find the poem demon. But yes, there are yes. actually two poems of demon, and also of, of angel. I believe that he he um, he believed in God. He um, he was spiritual, uh, but he um, his life interrupted very. Um, briefly, very shortly. He lived only 27 years. And in that period of time, he uh, managed to give us so much. Uh, uh, and uh, this is uh, very surprising for me, from where he could find so much um, uh, spiritual uh, information to, to give to us. Uh, previously, I... Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, I traveled to Georgia uh, because uh, some of my relatives used to live there uh, many years ago. And uh, I know that Lermontov also visited those places. And um, his poem, Mtsiri, was born there in, in Georgia. Yes, yes. And uh, I, was, um, I kept repeating his words uh, from this poem. <laughs> See this very beautiful poem. So maybe some of you haven't um, read this poem, so I advise you to to read. It's, it's very, very beautiful. Yes. I, I don't know how well it is trans translated uh, into English language, but in Russian, it's it's really beautiful. I mean, not only beautiful, but um, which poem is it? You have to be very talented to be to create su su such a such a work. Uh, yes, so he's something uh, much more than just, uh, you know... Could you say a line in Russian? Mitsiri. Huh? Mitsiri. Yes. What? I, I think... Mitsiri. Uh, uh, yes, Mitsiri. Exactly. Немного лет тому назад, когда сливаясь и шумя, обнявшись, будто две сестры, трое арагвы и куры. Yes. Yeah. Well, I believe that Lermontov, uh, for that time, uh, he had a very strong uh, sense of freedom uh, and uh, also uh, the, uh, about the justice as well. And maybe his uh, personality couldn't match at that time. And uh, that's why, uh, that's why um, his destiny was so complicated. And uh, he was exiled many times. But after this event, I will read more about his life story. 
because many things I didn't really know about uh, his life. <laughs> thank you. No, this. thank you, Darzok. No, I, I will definitely thank look you. at that theory. I, and I think the demon, the demon is as well. Um, uh, if you, if some of you haven't uh, read the theory, I believe you know um, half of Lermontov, even less. So your knowledge about Lermontov are not really completed. So no, no, I understand. I, I, yes. No point taken. Very much. No, no. We, <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot more work to do. But it's it's it's, it's a horrible if, thing. If we are allowed, and, uh, there is a uh, translation in English. Uh, well, I'll do it if there's not yes. one. No, it's such a challenge. It's not really easy to find uh, this translation. If someone yeah. is interested, I can. Yeah, uh, we could have we, we could have a subject Lermontov's yeah. narrative poems. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with Yaroslav because it is very contemporary freedom and oppression. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, no, that could be the title. But yes, or these not the self destruction, not self destruction at all. Well, no, no, but these are all views. I mean, we, you've got these are all views. Um, I mean, his behavior at the at the duel when he was killed by Martinov, he didn't have to do that. He didn't think that he, Martinov will just point at him because he didn't want it. No, but he didn't care. It, it seems he didn't care whether. Sometimes no, he, he did. He did. I, th I think, uh, Mr. David, I think uh, some uh, very, very extremely talented people, in some ways, maybe they provoke their destiny. They provoke, and they it makes them leave some situations where they can deeply understand the life. This is the explanation that I can give. Of course, he's not perfect. Um, his behavior wasn't, wasn't perfect um, in society. Uh, because, uh, you know, I believe much of the energy of these people is towards the um, inner, inner world, I understand. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes. No, no, I understand very much. No, this is all, there's a lot of rich. Um, so uh, very trans people are not really, uh, I mean, are not very uh, perfect people. So talent, they have weaknesses. They have a lot of weaknesses. So Lermontov yes, had some weak side, bad side of his personality. Yes. Well, no, we accept no that, are, yes. Are, 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 oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. No, I tried to go, I tried to present a reason a reasonably balanced portrait, not to shy away from those, but overall we have a we have a, a poet who was a genius, both as, in, as a prose writer and as a poet, and and a very a very interesting life. On any on any analysis, whatever the internal motivation. It is um, a bravery. He was very brave. Well, I agree absolutely. Yeah. The record shows that. Incredibly brave. Okay. On this high point. <laughs> Sorry. What? Okay. Thanks, Yaroslav. <laughs> and see you soon, I hope. Yeah, we'd um, like to. We'll meet. <laughs> well, let us yeah. hope. To repeat. <laughs> repeat. Yeah. Encore. Well, we'll repeat. No, we'll have Encore. a new. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, okay. I, hope we can have a, I hope we can have another poetry. Um, evening obviously on a different theme or a particular angle on Lermontov or, or another poet perhaps or another poetic no, theme I just suggest people who attend just to write to the Pushkin house what subject they wanted but we oh, would very like good to... idea very yeah. good yeah. idea and this it's has been to... tremendous success yeah. so thank you David thank you all and please um, come back come up with any new ideas and um, will be happy to accommodate. Okay. It's good to repeat again this, the whole evening, just <laughs> whole event today is exceptional event, exceptional. Should we call it a day? Yes. With regret, with regret. Definitely with regret. <laughs> no, but may I thank, um, Dennis, seriously, may I thank Pushkin yeah, Thank House you very much. For hosting us. You're welcome. Without welcome you, we couldn't do this. Yeah. So we do appreciate that. You. 
Thank you. Thank you for saying that. But you've done all the work and I mean, you, you've been amazing. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, but sure. you still did. <laughs> and, Have a great evening, everyone, and happy for attending. Uh,